God is in control. Hebrews 13 verse 5 and 6 Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Regardless of your present condition or situation, God is in control. He knows you by name and He knows your pain and heartfelt desire. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loves you with a love that is unique. He cares about you in ways that your mind can't comprehend. He hears your cry. He sees all you are going through. And He has not forgotten you. Close your eyes for a moment and just hear the voice of the Lord speaking to you telling you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Close your eyes for a moment and hear the voice of the Lord telling you that you are mine. You are my child. You belong to me. No one loves you the way God loves you. I sometimes feel sorry for unbelievers and for what they go through without God. At the point of death of an unbeliever, I am sure they are gripped with fear. Fear of not knowing what is coming next. Fear of not knowing what awaits after death. Fear of the flames of hell. But that is not what happens for a child of God. A child of God experiences death with no fear because they know where they are going. They know who they are going to spend eternity with. Revelations 21 verse 1 to 4 And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. For all eternity God will be your God. That is something to look forward to. God will be your God. That is a future to look forward to. God will be your God. That is what awaits you after death. What is stressing you today? It means nothing when you look at your troubles through the lens of eternity. For all eternity you always be joyful. For all eternity you will never experience pain or disappointment or sorrow, but joy. Your troubles are small in the lens of eternity. You need to know that the eye of the Lord sees all things and the ear of the Lord hears all things. God is watching 
God is listening to you. There is nothing about your life he is not aware of. The psalmist says that he that watches over you neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is not sleeping over your matter. He is fully in control, and he is working in ways that you cannot see. God has not fallen asleep. God is in control. And Hebrews 13 verse 5 reminds us of God's promise not to leave nor forsake us. God is your guide and leader. Therefore, we will not entertain any fear. David said that he, though he passes through the valley of the shadow of death, he will fear no evil because the presence of God is ever with him. Like David, we should know that God is in control. That God is in your life does not mean you will not face challenges, but you are sure of your victory. The storms of life could billow against you, your health could be challenging, your finances could be challenging too. But God is over all. Job 14 verse 7 to 9 says, For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stalk thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. It is the dead that have no hope. Your living shows that God is not done with you. Job went through a lot of challenges and storms in his days, but he had hope in God because his breath was not taken from his nostrils. Job knew that his Redeemer lives and he trusted in him. Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. He knew that God was aware of his predicaments. True to his words, in the fullness of time, God showed up in the life of Job and restored all his lost fortunes in double folds. If God did it for Job, he will do it for you. Don't give up on God, because he is in control. There is no situation beyond God's control. There is no challenge God cannot solve. Jeremiah 32 verse 27 says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? This is a question from the Lord. Is there anything beyond his control? What is it in your life that you think is beyond God's ability? Remember that with me it may be impossible, but with God all things are possible. There is nothing too difficult for God to do. What seems like a challenge or a mountain before you is nothing before the Lord. Your situation may be beyond your control, but it is not beyond the ability of God. Sometimes, God allows us to pass through certain challenges so that he can strengthen our faith by the testimony such challenge will birth. He is the creator of the universe and he is the force behind everything on earth. Although Satan is the god of this world, he is not god over the children of the Most High. Your situation is at the mercy of God, not the devil. You are under the watch of God. If you believe this, your faith will be strengthened to receive the miraculous. Haman arose against the Jews in Shushan in the days of Esther and Mordecai. He vowed to annihilate them all and he worked hard at it until the king sealed the decree with his signet. 
In those days, any decree sealed with the signet of the kings of Persia and Medes cannot be reversed. So, it seemed the situation was beyond the control of God. The Jews were already mourning before the set day of their destruction, but God came through for them and dealt with their enemy. Instead of being destroyed, the Jews waxed stronger in the land and they exercised rule and dominion over the people of the land wherein they were strangers. Our God is a specialist in turning situations around for the good of his people. In John 2 verse 1 to 9, Jesus was at the wedding held in Cana of Galilee and their wine got exhausted. It would have been a great shame to the bridegroom, but because Jesus was in the wedding program, all situations were under control. If Jesus is in your life, every situation is under control. Jesus cannot be stranded, he cannot be confused, neither can he be threatened by any situation at all. God is in control, but inflation is running rampant. God is in control. But I have no money, I am alone. You are not alone. Remember, God is in control. He has taken you this far, not to leave you now. In Mark 4 verse 36 to 41, Jesus was in a boat with his disciples and a storm arose against the boat. But Jesus was sleeping in the same boat. The reason Jesus could sleep in the boat is because there is no situation beyond his control. When his disciples called upon him, he arose and rebuked the storm, and there was a great calm. If Jesus is in your boat, Although the storm rages against you, your victory is sure. All you need to do is to call upon him. Don't murmur against God, rather pray to him. If the wind and the sea could obey the voice of Jesus, your situation would obey his voice too. God is in control of your life, therefore you cannot be defeated. Nothing can overcome you if you are in Christ because God is in absolute control of your life. The Fruits of the Spirit Joy Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not something that only the first Christians can experience, but it is something we can experience today. You and I can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, there are clear signs, clear evidences of the Holy Spirit of God. Evident in an individual's life, you cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit and there is no change in your life. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is what we can call the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 22 and 23 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Today we are going to look at one specific fruit of the Spirit, and that is joy. If we consider how many times the words joy, joyful, and rejoicing appear on the pages of our Bibles, we will see that there is a clear theme in the Bible. The worst day in salvation is better than the best day not being saved. The joy of the Lord can be seen in the life of a Christian. God has been good to us. He truly has been good to me. Count the blessings God has given you in your life and you will see that God is a good God to you. The unbelievers know nothing about joy. Joy is not how much money you have in the bank account or what stuff you can buy. Joy is knowing the giver of joy. 
So many people stay up at night and stress about how they can earn more money and acquire more treasure here on earth. But the truth is, if you know the Lord, you know your treasures are laid up in heaven. Let's look at the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 verse 18 and 19 And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. In verse 19, the Apostle Paul speaks of a joyful person. He did not say, Be filled with the Holy Spirit, and when you are, you will perform miracles or raise the dead. He said, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, that is joy. The Holy Spirit comes with a joy which cannot be explained, nor can it be contained. The truth about joy is that when you have it, no matter the situation you are in, the joy stands. There is a difference between laughter and joy. We must never take these two to be the same thing. You can laugh and not have joy in you. People can make you laugh, things can make you laugh, but they cannot necessarily give you joy. The true joy comes from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Do you have joy in you? Can you say that there is joy in you? Joy is a deep feeling of pleasure and happiness. Joy is a deep feeling of delight. Joy is something that a believer has in spite of circumstances, in spite of situations, in spite of the world. The joy that comes from the Holy Spirit stands. If your joy is not grounded in Christ, what you have is not joy. To be sincere, many things can give you joy. Money can give you joy, a good car can give you joy, good business deals can give you joy, a person can give you joy, a good result in your career and academics can give you joy. All of these things can give you joy, but none of these things can give you everlasting joy. All of these things are limited. You can have a good result today and tomorrow a bad result comes. The joy will fade away. You can have a booming business today and tomorrow it is not. The joy it gave will fade. When the new car stops working well and it is now taking your money, the joy it has given you will fade. All of these things give joy and they can take it away. What do you want to make your source of joy? This is the time to ask yourself this question. The Bible says in Psalm 16 verse 11 that Thou wilt shew me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The psalmist acknowledged that the fullness of joy is in the presence of God. There is nothing like a temporary joy. There is nothing like a half joy in the presence of God. The joy in the presence of God is in full, and it is everlasting. Now, tell me, which joy would you rather go for? We should not deceive ourselves. I am not going to say this is to scare you, but I just want to use it to encourage us. In this life, Everything will not go smoothly. Please know this to be true. Things will not always be going smoothly. And when that smooth thing that is giving you joy is gone, what do you have left? This is the reason why I want to tell us to choose the right source, to get everlasting joy. When the Holy Spirit of God enters into your life, the presence of God is already in you. The whole kingdom of God is in you. You have God in you, which means you have the fullness of joy in you. Look, if you have the Spirit of God in you, it doesn't matter what is going on around you. It doesn't matter what people are saying about you. You are just going to have joy 
always because you have faith in someone who is in you. Don't you know what the Bible says in 1 John 4 verse 4? It says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The one in you is capable of giving you the kind of joy that will cover all kinds of sorrow. The one in you is able to do exceedingly above all you can ask or think. So why would sorrow have a way in you? The Lord is telling you that greater is He on you than whatever is in that storm. That is enough to give you joy. People just talk about joy anyhow, and when they say it, I know they don't know what joy is. The joy of men is fading away. The happiness of man is going out. All the things that are making man happy are going out. The joy of the Lord remains forever. That is what the Bible says. It says that in the right hand of God is pleasure forevermore. There is no limit. Now choose the source of your joy. Some people make the source of their joy their ungodly relationship. A haven for fornication called boyfriends and girlfriends. When the relationship breaks, they go into depression and the devil attacks them from there. I am not saying your marriage should not give you joy. I am saying it should not be the source of your joy, but the ultimate source of your joy must be God, and that is when there will be true joy in your marriage. When the joy of God flows in you, it will flow in your marriage. Joy is so important in the life of a believer because the Bible tells in Nehemiah 8 verse 10, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord breaks chains. The joy of the Lord transforms you. 1 Peter 1 verse 8 and 9 whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Joy comes from God through salvation. The moment you give your life to Christ, you are open to the joy of God. This joy will kickstart when you allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. Today, many people have lost the joy of salvation, the joy that the Holy Spirit gave them. They have allowed sin to take it away. It is possible to lose the joy of salvation and this will happen when sin comes into your life. There is just one thing you need to do when this happens. Pray the prayer of the psalmist. Psalm 51 verse 12 Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Tell God to restore to you the joy of his salvation that has come to you. A lot of us need this prayer. It is a prayer we ought to be praying all the time. It is a prayer we need to be saying so that we will draw back to Christ and then restore to us the joy that comes through salvation. Ask for the joy of the Lord. Seek it. We shouldn't hesitate to do this. This world is full of wickedness. There is no joy in this world. All of the joy that having a car or that material things are giving are just the shadows of joy. They will soon fade. You need to rethink. You need to choose the right source. Let Jesus be your source. The greatest joy is the one that comes from knowing that Jesus died for you and resurrected. He destroyed the works of the devil. He brought life to everyone who wants it. All of these things will give you joy. When the world is blowing you storms or trying to make sorrow be in you, when you remember all that Jesus has done, you have joy in you. 
The joy that you have in life will always be in you. The Personality of the Holy Spirit John 14 verse 16 And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another Comforter, Counselor, Helper, Intercessor, Advocate, Strengthener, and stand by, that he may remain with you forever. One of the greatest misconceptions people have about the Holy Spirit is that they think he is just a force or an object. The Holy Spirit is not water, fire, wind, oil, a dove or air. He is a person, a person with feelings. He is not an it or a force or wind, he is a real person, and when you come to know him, he will become more real to you than life itself. He will become more real to you than the people you see around. He will become more real to you than the very air you breathe. Talk to him, love him, embrace him, grieve not the Holy Spirit, because he is the one you need. The Holy Spirit is the third person in the Godhead. God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He has all the attributes of God. He is omnipotent, which means he has unlimited power and is able to do anything. He is omnipresent, which means he is present everywhere all the time. His presence is not limited by time or space. Because God created the universe, He is above all things and holds all things together. He is omniscient, which means He is all-knowing. His knowledge is perfect and complete. He knows everything that ever was, is, or will be. It is impossible for us to understand this fully, because only God knows what it is like to know everything. The Holy Spirit speaks, He moves, He sees, and He has emotions. The Holy Spirit can be sorrowful when He is grieved. That means we can actually grieve the Holy Spirit. All these attributes of His prove that He is not an object, but a person. The Holy Spirit is the promise of God to all believers in Christ. He is to be our Comforter, Counselor, Helper, Intercessor, Advocate, Strengthener, and Standby. Let us consider the various attributes of the Holy Spirit that qualify Him as a person and not as a mere force or thing, as some people would presume. First, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. John 14, verse 16 and 17, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener and stand by, that he may remain with you forever. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. The word comforter in John 14 verse 16 refers to the Holy Spirit, and the Amplified Version of the Bible gives us a full scope of the Comforter's ministry. As a Comforter, the Holy Spirit is also our Counselor, Helper, Intercessor, Advocate, Strengthener, and Standby. We cannot have all these things in the Holy Spirit and live as if we are alone. Have you ever wondered at the reason the early believers were tortured and imprisoned and yet they remained joyful? It was because the Holy Spirit was their comforter. 
There wouldn't be a need for the comfort of the Holy Spirit if there is no distress in the world. Jesus never told us that there will be no difficult times in our lives, but he assures us of comfort through the Holy Spirit. No matter what you are passing through, the Holy Spirit is with you. He is strengthening you, fortifying you. He comes with strength into your life. The greatest cause of tragedy for believers does not lie first of all in the fact that they are faced with challenges, but in the fact that we are almost unconscious of the fact that the Holy Spirit is with us in our worst times. He comes with strength. Second, the Holy Spirit teaches. Jesus was preparing the hearts of his disciples for the hostility they will suffer when he is gone from them. He told them they would be brought before magistrates, but that they should not be anxious of what to say. He added in Luke 12, verse 12, saying, For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. So, the Holy Spirit will fill their mouths and teach them the accurate way to respond when they are brought before judges. This was fulfilled in the lives of the apostles, Paul inclusive. They spoke with great wisdom each time they stood before the elders. Stephen had the testimony that people could not resist the wisdom by which he spoke because the Holy Spirit taught him what to say in Acts 6 verse 10. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Third, the Holy Spirit convicts. In John 16 verse 8, Jesus said concerning the Holy Spirit, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts sinners of their sins and makes them to admit their need for the Lord before they can believe in the finished works of Christ for their salvation. It is not your amazing preaching, or your persuasive speech, or charm, or charisma that brings sinners to Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts sinners of their sin, that when they hear there is a God who is angry at them for their sin, they know it is true. And when they hear that Jesus died for them so that they may obtain eternal life, it is the Holy Spirit that tells them it is true. Again, the Holy Spirit convicts us each time we derail from the path of righteousness, thereby producing a godly sorrow that leads us to repentance. The Holy Spirit is the one who draws you back to Christ when you steer of the right path. Look at your own life and examine it. Before the Holy Spirit entered your life, you would live in sin and wallow in it and enjoy it and have pleasure in it, no problem. But ever since the Holy Spirit entered your life, when you now sin, there is a guilt that you feel. There is a godly sorrow which affects you now. You now struggle to live with sin. Why? because the Holy Spirit convicts. You don't enjoy sin the way you used to. Fourth, the Holy Spirit directs church affairs. Acts 13 verse 2 records the event that took place as certain prophets and teachers fasted and prayed to the Lord. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. The Spirit of God moves in churches. He moves. 
the Holy Spirit actually confirmed the apostleship of Paul and Barnabas and gave instruction to the church to separate them for the assignment. The Holy Spirit actually governed the affairs of the church and confirms the calling of men within the local church. Fifth, the Holy Spirit helps and intercedes. Romans 8 verse 26 Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with the groanings which cannot be uttered. Here, the Holy Spirit is pictured as the helper and the intercessor of believers. He helps our weaknesses and intercedes for us with groaning that words cannot express. You see, we do not actually know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit searches the mind of God and helps us to pray in alignment with God's will. If you pray without the help of the Holy Spirit, you will pray amiss. But the Holy Spirit strengthens us and also prays through us. Hallelujah! Sixth, the Holy Spirit inspires. 2 Peter 1 verse 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Bible was written by holy men through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. How could a man like Enoch, the seventh generation for Adam, prophecy about the second coming of Christ if he was not inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit breathed upon men in different generations, and they saw the mind of God and wrote according to the proportion of revelation they received. Seventh, the Holy Spirit sanctifies. 1 Peter 1 verse 2 says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. The Holy Spirit is constantly at work in believers to see that they are daily sanctified. The Holy Spirit continually helps us to become holier on daily basis as we walk with Christ. It is important to highlight that these functions cannot be performed by a force, power, influence or attribute of God. Only a person can do these things. The Holy Spirit is a person. Although he is invisible, he can manifest himself through several ways and his attributes are of person. The Holy Spirit is a person and he is sent to help us in our faith walk. Do not despise the ministry of the Holy Spirit because therein lies your comfort and consolation as a believer.